You're watching Credlin. Eleven terrorists, five in New South Wales and six in Victoria, are due for release from prison this year. Now, counterterrorism police are preparing to use controversial new powers, including continuing detention orders to prevent their release. These continued detention orders haven't been used in Australia since their introduction, but will likely be utilised to keep the likes of Abdul Ben Brika, the spiritual head of the 2005 Pendennis terror conspiracy, locked away. The member for Canning, Andrew Hastie, is chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. He joins me now live from Canberra. Andrew, before we get into some of the specifics here, thank you for coming on the show. You, you're a Good former to be with SAS you, Peter. soldier. You're a former SAS soldier. You're chair of one of the most powerful committees in the parliament, so you're privy to a lot of security information your other colleagues uh, outside the ministry do not have. Give us a sense of how real the terror threat still remains in Australia. Sure, Peter. Since 2014, the national uh, terror, terrorism threat level has been a probable, which means there are still people in our community with both the intent and the capability uh, to harm or kill Australians. So the threat is still live. Um, just because we've defeated ISIS and destroyed the caliphate doesn't mean the problem goes away. Their ideas live on, they'll reconstitute, and we need to be vigilant. So uh, the threat is still there and it should still be a concern for, for many people, uh, but at the same time, our government's on top of this, and that's, um, that's heartening. It's likely in Victoria that authorities will uh, apply for an order to uh, detain or keep in prison uh, Ben Breaker. I mentioned he was the spiritual head of the 2005 Pendennis uh, conspiracy. He, he's also Algerian-born. I don't know what his uh, citizenship or not status is at the moment, but uh, he's due for release on the 4th of November this year. Uh, you were part of a committee process that saw uh, continued detention orders put in place in a legislative sense. They haven't been used in Australia. Is this the sort of character you had in mind? Uh, well, I don't want to comment on individual cases, Peter, but certainly this Act was um, passed by the Parliament bipartisanly back in 2016, and it's for these sorts of cases that it was, that it was set up. Uh, so the continuing detention order regime means that uh, if, a, if a convicted terrorist offender is in their final year of their custodial sentence and they still pose a threat or a risk to the Australian community and to our safety, then uh, a state or territory supreme court can make an order and they can be kept behind bars for a further three years. So we're actually leading in Western democracies on this sort of thing. We've seen a few terrorist attacks recently in the UK where, uh, the last one at least in South London, where a, a, a terrorist offender was on parole and murdered a woman in the streets of London. Uh, that won't happen on the watch of the Morrison government because we have the legal architecture in place to stop those sort of people returning to our community if they haven't been rehabilitated. Yeah, two things I want to go into in a bit of detail there. The question of rehabilitation, we'll do that in just a moment. Uh, but the point in South London that you make is right. There was also an earlier case where someone had gone through a de-radicalisation program, so-called. He claimed he was no longer a radical, released on parole and walked into a, a policing conference, I think it might have been, or a sentencing prisoning conference uh, in London and also attacked people and there was a death in, in relation to that instance. So there's two cases where people have been out on parole. I know Boris Johnson has indicated he wants to change the laws in Britain and bring in something very much like this Australian model. Um, what's the evidentiary burden? How does the, uh, the authorities go forward uh, to make the case? What sort of evidence do they have to have that this person could uh, show or pose a risk if they are let out? Well, just to your first point, Peter, the UK has a system whereby uh, a terrorist offender automatically re is released halfway through their sentence on parole. Uh, we don't have that. In fact, last year in December, we legislated against the per presumption of parole or bail. Uh, so terrorist offenders will complete their full sentence and will indeed um, face a CDO if they haven't shown signs of rehabilitation. Now, how do you determine that? Well, um, our government will take advice, the court will take advice from uh, professionals, law enforcement, intelligence agencies who will make a risk assessment of the individual in question and then um, the court will make a judgment on that basis. But certainly if, okay. they, if they haven't recant, 
if they haven't recanted from um, the ideology that first inspired them, well, that would be a, a pretty um, good indicator that they're not fit to return to our community. Other than what they say, and this was highlighted in a Lowy Institute report, I think it was a couple of months ago, where it showed that basically there's no evidence to say de-radicalisation programs work. Uh, there's no uh, objective test you can apply. There's no blood test, let's say. I think Nigel Farage has said that, uh, that you take sure. to prove you're a terrorist and you take to prove that you're no longer a terrorist. How can we be sure when someone recants and says, I'm no longer a radical, I've seen the light, how can we trust their word and put them back into the community? Well, that's a really good question, Peter. Um, you, you can't know the state of someone's soul and people can hide these things. In fact, we have people living amongst us who are, who are plotting to, to do us harm. Um, we've seen that with the disruption of terror plots over the last five years or so. Um, but what we can do is put in measures and this government has, has we've got control order regimes, we've got the continuing detention order regime, um, our operational uh, agencies work round the clock 24-7, they're going after these guys and I have confidence in the leadership of ASIO, ASIS, ASD, AFP, uh, those people charged with protecting the Australian community. Uh, previously, when I've spoken to you, we've talked about the likelihood of returning foreign fighters. Now, I'm alive to the fact there's about 100 Australians unaccounted for overseas. Some, I think we, we assume, out of the 200 or so that went are well and truly dead. And that is a good thing. And mm -hmm. There's no remorse here on this side of the desk. Um, but, no, but where indeed. do we go with, <laughs> with the returning um, foreign fighters, those that we haven't been able to revoke citizenship for, um, how concerned are you as a legislator in this area with expert knowledge about the risk they might pose when they're back in Australia? Well, yes, they are going to be a risk and that's why uh, the Morrison government in 2018, with Labor's support, I should add, passed the temporary exclusion order regime, which allows our intelligence agencies, our law enforcement, to control the re-entry of a foreign fighter or terrorist back into Australia for, for prosecution and conviction and jailing if required. Um, so that's, that's a new framework. Again, um, we're, we're leading other democracies in putting this sort of architecture in place. Um, so I feel confident that this government um, is on top of it and is managing this problem. Obviously there's been some um, sort of comfort that we've taken out the, of recent events to say that ISIS as the construct it was four or five years ago um, has been defeated but of course a lot of the personnel are still there um, some of the organizational protocols are still there and there is concern that they are regrouping uh, how do you feel about the current situation in the isis territory uh, the former isis territories yeah i'm i'm nervous as as we should be because although we've destroyed the caliphate um, there are people across the Western world who, who still hold to their ideology and uh, they've gone dark, they're using end-to-end -end encryption and other ways to communicate and organise. And again, this is where our government has led. Um, in late 2018, we passed the, the telecommunications um, amendment uh, or the encryption bill and that now allows our agencies and law enforcement to go after these guys when they go dark. So um, they're still out there, we've got to be vigilant and um, I just want people to know that the Morrison government, government is on top of it. Andrew Hasty, as always, thanks for your insights. Um, and as the Prime Minister would say, thank you for your service. <laughs> thank you very much, Peter. Always a pleasure.